you have a creator, they have an audience, they bring their audience across different platforms, those platforms put them in front of an audience, and then the cycle continues. Uh, I am not gonna do push-ups on stage, no one wants to see that. Um, so, as you heard, I am talking about the end of social media. The timing is interesting, isn't it? Um, but to preface, it's the end of social media as we know it. Um, does anyone out there not enjoy using the internet anymore? Can you just give me a big round of applause if you're kind of tired of using the internet? That's kind of what I thought. Um, so obviously, this talk is about what are we going to do next? And the answer is we're probably going to be doing all of the things that were just mentioned, short form video apps, group chats, and obviously be taken over by artificial intelligence. But before we get to that, if you've never heard of me before, I write a newsletter called Garbage Day. And I cover a couple things, a couple buckets, online platforms, particularly how they're kind of going the way of MySpace right now. I cover internet drama, the best thing in the whole world, why people fight online and what they're talking about, memes and trends, and emerging tech. This is a newer one, so I talk about crypto, why it's probably not so smart, in, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence, why it's not so intelligent, things like that. So as I said, social media feels really old. Animated GIFs feel really old. I'm sure all of you have a younger coworker who is in a Slack room told you that GIFs are for boomers, perhaps. You've maybe heard that. Um, so how do we know that social media is getting old? I have a couple examples for you. And the first one I want to talk about are bad food videos on Facebook. Has anyone seen a video of an American doing something really bad with food on Facebook? Round of applause. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. So a couple years ago, I also was wondering why these people are doing this. And I tracked down a couple of them, and it turns out many of them are Las Vegas magicians. This is real. They all work together for a man named Rick Lax, and they have figured out how to hijack Facebook's algorithm. And the way that they do that is by making food in toilets, or washing a chicken in a sink with soap, or power drilling a hot dog. And they have gotten this down to such a science that they can pass each of their videos around their pages and make them go viral, effectively making Facebook kind of worthless, right? The next example we have is my favorite, Twitter Blue. The greatest experiment in mankind to destroy a social network as fast as humanly possible. If you haven't heard of this, essentially Twitter now allows you to pay for verification. When you do that, your replies shoot to the top. It's $8 a month. And the kinds of people who are paying for that ha aren't that interesting. And I don't mean that meanly if any of you do pay for Twitter Blue. But at least in America, it has resulted in a lot of scams, impersonations, harassment. It's turned Twitter effectively into Facebook. Uh, it's a lot of people with like Patriot Mom 1776 uh, telling you that she thinks vaccines aren't real. So that's kind of the vibe right now on Twitter. Once again, kind of feels like it's decaying a little bit, right? This is a new one, and this is really interesting. So has anyone seen this woman uh, on Twitter, on TikTok? Has anyone seen this video? No? Interesting. So this, is, uh, this was being passed around as a, as a podcast that this clip was going viral from. And in the podcast, she says a lot of, uh, let's just say like very racy things about how to please your man. And once again, I got curious. I, I thought, okay, well, who is this woman? What is this podcast? Where did this video come from? It turns out there is no podcast. She put a microphone in front of herself to make it look like she was being interviewed on a podcast and then put the clip on Instagram and TikTok as a way to advertise her OnlyFans. She's a porn star. Uh, so as you can start to feel, there are growth hacks happening at such a rate on these major platforms that it's not really right to say what's happening on them is authentic or genuine anymore. It, it's this weird, I've been using the term uh, KFAB content. It's like WWE. And then we also have the, uh, the, the failure of the cryptocurrency movement to fix any of this. There was this idea right after the lockdowns were lifted during the pandemic that crypto could be the new thing. Web3 could fix all the problems with the internet. Own your own data but it's all crashed really hard, and it hasn't come back. This little guy is my favorite example of sort of the, uh, the problems with the crypto movement. This is the mascot for Crypto Island, which was a project where a bunch of crypto guys were gonna buy an island with Bitcoin and then create their own country there, and obviously that did not go well. 
uh, as you can imagine. So, as I'm saying, digital public spaces are receding. We're no longer comfortable sharing our opinions on them because we're going to get dogpiled by someone who's like part of QAnon or something. It's not a fun time online anymore. And I think that's why we're seeing this switch to what I've been calling private public internet. Apps that let you toggle between talking to your friends privately and, for instance, watching a guy talk about perfume. You know, that's the dynamic that people, I think, want right now. They want to look at things the way they would look at Netflix and then do all of their socializing privately. And so some examples are Be Real, which was sort of hot about a year ago. I'm not quite sure if it's going to make the bounce back. Snapchat has had a resurgence in the U.S., although it's also sort of wobbly right now. And then you have the war between Instagram and TikTok, which offer this acutely, this idea of there's the performer on the feed and then there's your friends in the group chat. We're also seeing a lot of viral apps, and they're not apps in the traditional sense, the idea that you download an app and then you're using it like Flappy Bird or something. My favorite example is Wordle, which is just a website that people go to, um, which is amazing. I haven't had someone send me a website to check out in like 15 years. But then you also have games going viral on platforms like Twitch, and this one is Among Us, the uh, Mafia-style game set in space, and that's AOC playing it in a very viral live stream a few years ago. But you're also seeing a return to a model that we saw about 15 years ago as well, which is something I've been calling editorial with community. So two really good examples from the U.S. were somethingawful.com, which was sort of this anarchic, funny message board that had writers that would write for it. And you also had crack.com, which was similar. It was funny um, lists and, and sort of good articles. And then you had uh, a community that would use the message board. And that model is exactly what Substack released about two weeks ago, which is that you can write on Substack, you can send out your newsletter, but you can also go into their notes section, which is a Twitter alternative that is a central feed of all the writers talking. We're also seeing the, uh, the rise of what is commonly referred to as dark social, which sounds very cool and scary, but it's just people doing email and texting. Uh, this is some data from Statista.com, and it's the rise over the last few years of private messaging apps, particularly in the U.S., but this is also a trend that we're seeing across Europe as well. I mean, you guys had WhatsApp long before we knew how to text, so I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but we're also sort of seeing this idea of the online hub shifting from a public thing, like a Facebook group or a Facebook page, to a Discord. So this is the Discord for my newsletter, Garbage Day. Um, and I wouldn't read what's on there. Uh, my users are, you know, they're wonderful. But uh, it's a private space for a reason. So I want to change gears real quick. Uh, anyone seen this Pope picture before? Probably, right? You can clap if you, yeah, that's what I thought, okay. So let's talk about artificial intelligence, because this is the big question, right? Is it going to eat the whole internet? Is it going to eat all of our jobs? Will I be a machine janitor for the rest of my life? Probably not. But a real quick explainer here, if you've seen the Pope in a coat, for instance, it was made on an app called Midjourney, and there are two others that people use, Dolly2, which is open, uh, owned by OpenAI, and Stable Diffusion, which is open source. And you, if you have an M2 MacBook, you can run Stable Diffusion on it without an internet connection. So that's pretty cool. So I've been trying to talk about how to identify an AI image. And these four, I think, are really useful. So the major way you can identify an AI image, although it's not perfect, is the excessive amount of orange and blue. The theory is that the AIs are trained on so many movie posters that they spit out the same color palette of, say, The Hunger Games or Harry Potter. But also, there's some other things to look for. Is the subject of the image in the center? Probably AI. The fingers thing you've all probably heard of that can't do fingers, it can now, as you can see. Most of those police officers have the exact amount of fingers a human should have. But other tells are, do they have too many teeth? Are their eyes going in opposite directions? But then another good one is looking in the background. So in a traditional photo, there would still be a lot of clarity in those police officers in the way, way back. But as you can see, the AI sort of loses interest uh, with anything that isn't in the, in the center focus. We're also seeing the rise of audio-visual AI, and we're going to get to some examples in a second, but the major way they're being created is with a tool called Runway, 
or the audio clones, as you probably have heard, are coming from mostly an app called Eleven Labs. And the way these work is pretty simple. You take 30 to 40 seconds of something, you feed it into the AI, and it creates a model. When it comes to audio, you want to find audio that is studio recorded, because the AI will include background noises in its model, and then all of a sudden you've got Joe Biden talking with like birds chirping and stuff. So here's a, here's a really good example of where we are with AI video. This shows you what's capable, but it also shows you what's absolutely not capable of doing. <laughs> oh, that's hot. That's hot. Uncle Phil, come try this. Fresh pasta of Bel Air. Right. So as you can see, it can kind of figure out Will Smith, but it really can't do pasta, and this is a thing that a lot of people on the internet have figured out, that it can't do anyone eating pasta. It also can't show people holding a game controller. It can't figure out which direction it's supposed to face. So there are also chat bots. You've probably used one of them at some point, but the major ones are Microsoft's Bing AI, which is running on a version of ChatGPT, which is owned by OpenAI, and then we have poor little Google Bard, which I have yet to find a use for, but hey, They'll figure it out eventually, right? Uh, and most recently, we've had OpenAI Open AI release GPT-4. The major thing that this thing can do, though it's not accessible to the public yet, is that it can see. So if you feed it an image, it can tell you what's in the image, and it can offer you, you know, advice on what to do. So for the example they used is they said, can I make ingredients with these? The AI was able to identify these foods but it could not give you a, a, a good recipe for using them, so it's not super smart yet. But this is what really worries me, and I bring this up all the time because it freaks me out really bad, which is that they asked it to solve a capucha, and obviously we all know robots can't solve capuchas. So what it did was it hired a gig worker, a task rabbit, and asked the human gig worker to solve the capucha for it. The human asked, are you an AI? And the AI said, no, I'm blind. So. That's horrifying, and I'll let you all sit with that for just a second, because that, that's really unnerving to me. Um, so we're already seeing internet communities use AI to create content, and my favorite example is from Tumblr. Tumblr fans uh, asked ChatGPT to write a song in the style of My Chemical Romance called Volcano Shake'em Up, and then the users started covering it as if it was a real song. And I think this is a really good example of sort of an organic community move to play with these tools in a way that isn't scuzzy or scammy or weird. We also have the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week live stream of, of an AI trying to create episodes of Seinfeld. It's called Nothing Forever. It was very popular for a while, and then it had to be taken down because it became transphobic. And this is, I think, a really good example of the limits of this technology, especially AIs that are hooked up to a live feed of the internet. They're, they don't think, they're not smart, they're not sentient, so they just sort of spit out whatever is on the internet. And as we all know, the internet is not a great place to just pull random stuff from. So all of this is kind of converging on the idea of AI content, and this is a really... Nope, hold on. This is a really good example. Oh, Balenciaga, Harry. Right, so that is Harry Potter as Balenciaga models. It was created with the tools that I just showed you, Eleven Labs audio clones, Runway. It was uh, animated with a, an avatar app called DID. We're also seeing the rise of AI music now. So the big development in the last couple of weeks is a TikTok user called Ghostwriter, who started uploading AI clones of Drake to Spotify and is having those songs taken down, obviously, for copyright infringement. And then my favorite, very British example is AISIS. Um, which is a, an Oasis cover band that replaced their lead singer with an AI model of the Gallagher brothers, and it sounds like this. It's not this part, it's the next part. So, Pretty good, right? Not bad. It sounds almost real. And this is all leading to my kind of general idea of where we're headed. Obviously, I'm just 
some guy looking at the internet, same as you, so I could be wrong here, but based on what I'm seeing, this is where I think we're going. Um, I also made this with different emojis, but then it converted them, so that's kind of interesting. I didn't plan for that. That's cool. Anyway, so the th I'm calling it the three internet era. So you have dark social, entertainment feeds, synthetic interfaces. So first, dark social, as we said, it's email, it's text messages, it's just old-fashioned sharing stuff in private with your friends and your family. And this also kind of counts for TikTok because you can download a TikTok video and you can forward it without using the app. We also have entertainment feeds, so TikTok. Basically, there are a lot more creators than they were 15 years ago. Everything I've seen says that we're seeing even more creators in the next five years, possibly creators becoming their own media brands. I'm kind of waiting for like Mr. Beast to announce he's gonna buy Vice Magazine or something. I think we're gonna see more of this. And the way that content travels is changing as well. So you used to have the brand or the publisher, the platform, the audience, you know, sometimes the audience would make stuff that would then go back on the brand or publisher's site, and the cycle would continue. It's a little more nuanced now, so you have a creator, they have an audience, they bring their audience across different platforms, those platforms put them in front of an audience, and then the cycle continues, right? So we're seeing creators kind of get a lot more savvy about not being in one bucket like they used to be. And then finally, we have synthetic interfaces. So this is the new My AI on Snapchat. I asked it, do you have a good joke about Germany? And it said, why don't Germans tell jokes about sausage? Because they're the worst. Pretty good, right? Um, and Snapchat is not alone here. Uh, a couple months ago, Discord announced that they would be releasing Clyde, which is the same idea. It is a AI that lives in your app, and you can talk to you like a person, and it can generate images, it can give you advice, whatever you want. So, in summation, three internets. Independent publishing, online video, generative AI. I think this is what's going to happen, but I could be wrong. But thank you guys for listening. Once again, my name is Ryan Broderick. My newsletter is called Garbage Day. Thank you so much.